December 20th and it's going to be all day. You know, and it's also another opportunity for us to get people from the community to come through our doors. And I'll be here myself to meet, to greet and meet some people uh, as well. So <clears throat> without further ado, I'd like to invite you guys to stand as we reverence the reading of God's holy word. Uh, the lesson this morning is going to be a little different. Our first reading where we'll come from Psalm chapter 116. Psalm chapter 116. Let's just read those few verses for now. Psalm chapter 116, verse number 12, 13, and 14. What shall, I, <clears throat> what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the, the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. What shall I render to the Lord for all his blessings toward me? Pray with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, sometimes we don't have the words to, to say thank you. So this morning, I'd like to use the words of this song that I heard yesterday. The title of the song is Thank You. And in the song, the writer, the singer says, I can shout till my voice gives way. I can leap till I have no strength. I can lose my breath trying to explain. I can't praise you enough. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you because I'm so grateful. You wept. Till I found my strength. You lost your breath, dying to save me. Now I'll never go back to that grave. I can't praise you enough. And if time were to stall, I can never tell it all. Words are few, but this will have to do. Lord, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for your goodness. I just want to thank you for your kindness. I want to thank you for your faithfulness because I am standing on the promises. I am surrounded by your goodness. You have overwhelmed us and I just want to thank you. In Jesus name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Beloved, has someone ever did something for you? Has someone ever helped you out during a difficult time and the words, thank you, seem way too small? They seem way too small in comparison to the magnitude of what they've done for you. That's how we ought to feel every single day towards God. If I were to ask all of you this morning, what are you thankful for? We'd be here all day. I'd like to believe. Generally speaking, when people are expressing their gratitude towards God, they are most likely to be thankful for three general things, family and friends. And I believe we ought to be thankful for that. A lot of us, we are thankful for material blessings. If someone go to your home and they said, you have a beautiful house, we say, I'm blessed. If I go in the parking lot and I'm like, oh, that's a nice car. You said, yes, God has blessed me. If you have a good job, you're making a lot of money. You're like, man, that's a good job. You said, God has blessed me. Because we understand the need to say thank you because we know we've been favored by God. Another thing that people like to be grateful for is their health. Good health, to be specific. When you've been sick and you are healed, we say thank you. When you know the doctor said, we don't know what to do, but eventually there's a solution, you say, Lord, thank you. And yes, we are to be thankful for all these things. But this morning, before we get, we start talking about the specific text I have in mind, I want to remind you of three things that I believe we disciples of Christ ought to be thankful for 
Three things we need to make sure they are part of our prayer repertoire every day. Every single day, we need to say thank you, number one, for the necessities of life. And the reason why I'm saying this is because sometimes we can take them for granted. Water, we can take it for granted. We just open the faucet and there it is, right? The air you breathe, you can take that for granted. Everybody take a deep breath. Inhale, exhale. That's God right there. Thank you. How about the fact that there are certain things that happen in our lives, certain things that we enjoy in this country. We may consider them to be normal occurrences. They are just necessities of life that we have easy access to. The fact that if you are sick, you can go to the doctor and get help. Not everyone in the world has that kind of easy access to health care. We need to learn how to say thank you. Every breath you take is a blessing from God. Every step you take is a blessing from God. Every time you wake up in the morning and you get to see another day, it's a blessing from the Lord. Every bill you get to pay, you think it's because you worked so hard? No, God gave you the strength to pay that bill. Your job is a blessing. Your kids, they might give you a good headache every now and then, but believe me, they are a blessing. Beloved, let's never get to the point where we allow the necessities of life, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, to become normal occurrences that we stop, we fail to appreciate God for providing them. The second thing we need to be thankful for on a daily basis are the trials of life. Oof. This one's tough. There are not that many people in the world, even in the church, who are grateful for the trials of life. Why would I be grateful for something that brings so much pain in my life? Something that is hurting me, not healing me. Well, besides the fact that Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 16, 17, and 18, Paul says, be thankful in all circumstances, whether things are favorable or not favorable. Be thankful. Things don't have to be all right for me to say, Lord, I thank you. Because gratitude, you see, it's a mindset that can help you endure in the midst of trial. Gratitude in the midst of hard time, it's about trusting God for what he's yet to do in your life. And now that takes faith. Lord, I'm going to praise you now. You can bless me later. And I'm going to thank you for what I know you're going to do in my life. Now that takes faith. I don't know what I'm going to I don't know why I'm going through certain things sometimes, but Lord, I'm going to thank you because I know the Bible says all things work together for the good to those that love God and are called to his purpose. So I can stand firm and thank God in the midst of hard times because I know God got my back. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 3, Paul says we can rejoice in the midst of our sufferings. We don't need to wait for God to bring us out of it to say thank you. I can thank him now because the trials of life produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character gives us hope. And guess what, beloved? Hope in God never disappoints. And that is why we need to learn how to say thank you in the midst of our trial. Last but not least, this is possibly the most important thing disciple of Christ need to be grateful for. And yet, I don't think we are grateful enough for that. Eternal life. Eternal life. Are we grateful for eternal life? Those of us who have Jesus Christ in our lives, we are guaranteed a place in heaven with God. Are you grateful for that? Do you thank God every day for the possibility of being in heaven with him someday. Are we grateful for that? Brothers and sisters, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 18, Paul says, For I consider 
the current suffering, whatever is going on in my life right now, they are not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us in heaven. They're not even worthy to be compared. But a lot of times we want to be grateful for the things that are happening now. The things that we can see, the things that we have. But God wants us to be grateful for heaven. Be grateful because one day we will see beloved who have passed away. And one day we know we are going to see them in heaven. Oh, I believe we'll be able to see their faces and we will know their names. I'm looking forward to that and I'm grateful for that. One day we will be able to see Jesus. One day we will be able to see Peter and Moses and David and Paul and all these guys who've gone before us. Oh, I'm grateful for that. We can praise him now. We can worship him right now. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven to start singing some praises to God. I can praise him right now. Because we have the promise of eternal life. As we talk about gratitude, as we talk about expressing our heartfelt thankfulness for the things that God has done for us, the things that God will continue to do for us, the question I want to ask, Lord, how can I thank you? Lord, how can I thank you? That's the title for a lesson this morning. Lord, I know I'm supposed to be grateful, but how? Lord, I am overwhelmed with everything you've done for me, but how can I say thank you? It's a great question to ask because gratitude is more than just saying thank you. Gratitude, it's more like a lifestyle. There are many ways we can express our gratitude to God. However, I believe it all can be summed up in two. The first way we express our gratitude towards God is in the way we worship. We show gratitude by worshiping God. One of the most popular subject, I mean story in the Bible that preachers like to use to speak on Thanksgiving weekend is found in, um, is found in the, um, the gospel. It's the story of those 10 lepers that Jesus and his disciples, he encountered these people at the border of Samaria and Judea. And the Bible says when Jesus encountered this man, this man must have heard that Jesus can heal it all. Whatever you have, Jesus can heal it. So they ran to Jesus and asked Jesus for help. And Jesus looked at them and Jesus said, go show yourself to the priests. According to Leviticus law, the Bible says, when you are healed, then you can go show yourself to the priest. The problem is, they weren't healed yet. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. But Jesus, we still got leprosy on our body. Go show yourself to the priest. They must have had some type of faith that something was going to happen. Because the Bible says, as they were going, their body starting to get healed. That's faith. They didn't wait for Jesus to heal them right then and there before they started to make their way to the priest. No, they started to walk. And as they were walking, as they were going, as they were leaving, they started to be healed. But here's the kicker. One of them realized what was going on. None of them was like, they probably were so eager to get back to normal life because when you have leprosy, you are ostracized from society. You are not allowed with the general population. You are living in quarantine for the rest of your life. So these nine men, they probably were so excited to get back to their normal day-to-day -day life, they just kept going. But one of them, he was a Samaritan. He went back to Jesus. Jesus had 12 Jews who were following him who did not like Samaritans. And this Samaritan, unlike these other Jews who kept on going, was the one who went to Jesus. When he realized what Jesus has done for him, the Bible says he fell at the feet of Jesus and he started to worship. That's just the natural way for us to express our gratitude. 
If you read in verse number 14, the Bible says, when he saw he was healed, he fell at the feet of Jesus and he started to praise God with a loud voice. He was praising God with a loud voice. Lord, I just want to thank you. I've been ostracized for most of my life, but because of what you've done for me, now I can see my family again. I just want to thank you. Lord, the doctor said there's no cure for what I have, but they didn't know that you are the great physician. Lord, I just want to thank you. And in my head, I can't imagine, just like uh, 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 in Mark chapter 10, there's another story about the blind Bartimaeus. In my head, I can just imagine that as they were shouting the name of Jesus, as they were praising with a loud voice, there were probably some people like they did to Bartimaeus. What are you doing? Jesus is right here. You don't need to yell. You don't need to scream like that. They try to shut him up. Read your Bible in Mark chapter 10. They're like, stop yelling. Jesus is right here. Excuse me. You don't know what Jesus has done for me. You don't have any jurisdiction over my praise. Who are you to tell me how loud I can praise my Jesus? Lord, I just want to thank you. Oh, this guy was not going to stop in, to let anybody stop him from praising God and worshiping God how he had it in his heart to do. Nobody has jurisdiction over your praise. We show gratitude in the way we worship. Sometimes I wonder if we are here to look cute. If we are here to just look proper, but do we understand, do we realize the need to worship, the need to lift our voices and praise God for the things that he has done for us? Because that's what the Samaritan understood about what Jesus just did for him. That's what Bartimaeus understood about what Jesus what just did for him. They're like, Bartimaeus, you need to shut up. Uh, no, I am not going to shut up. I'm just going to praise my God. Because when you understand what God has done for you, nobody can stop you from worshiping God. Nobody needs to tell you to worship God. Because you understand it. You appreciate it. The second way I think we express our gratitude towards God is in the way we live our lives in the way we live our lives. You know, the first part as far as praise and worship, I think most of us understand that. But this is the part that I think we, we fall short sometimes. You wanna be grateful? You need to be grateful in the way you live your lives. Let me show you a text in Micah chapter six. I want you to write it down because I'm not going to have time to really dissect this text this morning. So I want you to read it on your own time. In Micah chapter 6, the Bible is reminding, the prophet Micah is reminding God's people of the things that God did for them. Listen to that. God said through the prophet Micah, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I did that for you. I sent Moses to lead you. I did that. I sent Aaron and Miriam to help. My people, remember what Balak, in the book of Numbers, I believe, 22, Balak, the king of Moab, plotted and wanted Balaam, the son of Beor, I'm sorry, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Acacia Grove to Gilgad that you may know the righteousness, the righteous acts of the Lord. So God is reminding his people of all the things he's done for them to get where they were. So now automatically the people of Israel said, what do we do? We need to worship. We need to say thank you. They're like, what can we bring to the Lord for the things he's done for us? Because when you understand, when you acknowledge what God has done for you, the natural response is to say thank you. It's to worship God. It's to give back. Listen to what they say. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow down before God, the most high, with offerings of yearling calves? 
Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our own children to pay for our sins so that we can show God that we are grateful? What should we do, Micah? Listen to what Micah said. Micah said, God has shown you what you should do. You want to show God how grateful you are for everything he's done for you, Israel? Here's what you need to do. Act justly, love mercy, and walk with humility. Oh yeah, I want you to worship me. I want you to say thank you. I want you to give back. But if you really want to be grateful, you need to act justly. You need to be merciful. And you need to walk with humility. Justice, mercy, and humility. And the funny thing in the New Testament, Jesus said they are the most important aspect of the law. Beloved, does God need to remind you of all the things he's done for you, for you to start showing some gratitude? Does God need to remind you of what he's done in your life and how many times he rescued you for you to start saying thank you? You know, I don't know how many times my mama told me, I give birth to you. Anybody here ever heard that mama said that? I brought you into this world so I can, there you go, you know my mama. I don't know how many times they reminded me of the things they've done for me. Because they want me to be grateful. They want me to appreciate them. Oh, I do that with my boys all the time. Andre is four. I'm like, Andre, that mac and cheese you're eating, I made that. They need to know. Sometimes God has to remind you of how much he's done for you in order for you to be grateful. But the question is, how can you be grateful? We can pray and say thank you. We can come here in this building and worship and show our gratitude. We can give money back to the church. We can sing, thank you, Lord, for helping me. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. We can do all of that to show our gratitude. But God said, you really want to be grateful? Love mercy, love justice, and humility. That's about how you live your life. It's about how you treat other people that will show God how grateful you are for the things he's done for you. Beloved, when God blesses you, if you are grateful, what you need to do is be a blessing for someone else. Read Genesis chapter 12. God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you a lot. Why? Because I want you to be a blessing for other people. When God forgives you, if you are grateful for the forgiveness of God, yes, you need to praise God. Yes, you need to thank God for forgiving you. But what you really need to do is to forgive somebody else. Read Matthew chapter 18. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unmerciful servant? You remember the king, this man owes, the Bible says, 10,000 talents. I know that may not sound impressive, but if you try somebody try to compute that into today's money, and it's about $10 billion. Imagine you owe someone $10 billion, and the king said, listen, according to the law back then, you need to sold your wife and your kids into slavery, and you need to come work for me so that you can pay this amount of money. There's no way you're going to pay $10 billions of dollars in a lifetime by serving for someone. But the Bible says this man begged for mercy. He begs for forgiveness. Be patient with me. The king said, you know what? I forgive you. This man in the parable who owed $10 billion went to somebody else who owed him five hundred. dollars He was choking him to death. You need to pay me my $500. And the person said the same thing to him that he said to the king, forgive him. Please be patient with me. Please forgive me. He was like, no, throw him in jail. Sometimes that's how we behave with other people. When God forgives you, how do you show gratitude? By forgiving someone else. That's how you need to be grateful. If God has saved you and you believe that God really loves you, you cannot keep the gospel to yourself. You need to share the gospel with somebody else. That's 
how you show gratitude. But in this text, in Micah chapter 6, God's people were acting up. When Micah reminded them, do you remember what God did for you to get where you are? To be in the position that you are? They're like, Micah, what should we do? Should we worship? Should we go to the temple? Should we burn offerings? Should we do this? Yes, God will take all of that. But you need justice in the land. You need mercy with your fellow neighbor. And you need to be humble about it. Beloved, in the New Testament, sometimes the Pharisees overemphasized some teachings. It's not that they were wrong, but they tend to overemphasize some teachings of the law unlike others. We need to ask ourselves, do we overemphasize certain teachings in the church and we fail to emphasize things like justice, mercy, and faith? Ask ourselves that. Because that's the same issue Jesus had with the Pharisees. They had no problem bringing up things like circumcision. Everywhere they went, they were all about circumcision. Even the Pharisees who became Christians, they still bring that up. And you know what circumcision is today? It's baptism. Read Colossians chapter 2. Do we talk about baptism a lot? Oh, yes, we do. And I will not stop talking about it. There's nothing wrong about that. But do we talk about justice just as much? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Because Jesus had a problem with that. They're always emphasizing circumcision or fasting and praying. In the Bible, in Acts chapter 15, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised. Oh, we're not going to stop. Even if we, we, they didn't even need that in the church, but they were bringing it into the church saying, you need to be circumcised to be saved. As a result, there was a whole council form in Jerusalem. The elders, the preachers, and all of them, they had to decide. They wrote about it, and they're like, no, you guys need to slow your roll. You want to be circumcised? That's fine, but don't bind that on other people in the church. They also emphasize other things like washing of hands. Now this was a tradition, and they turned that tradition into a command. In Exodus chapter 30, as a matter of fact, it was a command from God to the priest. It wasn't to everybody. Read your Bible, Exodus chapter 30. But they took that, a command that God gave to the priest, and said everybody needs to wash their hands all the time, especially before you eat. If you don't do that, you are not a true disciple. In Matthew chapter 15, they called Jesus out. Oh, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrive from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They ask him, why do your disciples obey, disobey our old age tradition, which started all the way back in the book of Exodus, for they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. They turn that tradition into a command. They were expecting everyone, if you don't wash your hands, there's something wrong with that. I want to know, I, I, like, I like the idea of washing my hands before I eat, but that's not a command from God. Beloved, sometimes when religious traditions are upheld for so long, some people start believing there are commands from God. And we in the church, we need to be careful with that. There are certain things that might be tradition. They are not biblical commands. And you need to stop telling folks to do it how you do it so that their worship can be acceptable when it's not from the Bible. Because that's what those Pharisees were doing. They're like, oh, yeah, you need to wash your hands. You need to be circumcised. Well, good for you, but I don't have to do it like that. Because these are your traditions. They are not biblical commands. We got to be careful with that. And they were overemphasizing on these teachings a lot. Not only that, they also overemphasized on not associating yourself with sinners. Oh, they had a problem seeing Jesus and his disciples eating with tax collectors and sinners. In Luke chapter 5, verse number 30, then Levi, whose name was uh, Matthew, 
held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? What are you doing here? Think of this as, how can I explain that to make sense? It's like you are to go out and you see me at a bar with someone. I don't do that. That's just an example. I could. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You see me at a bar with someone and you start thinking, what are you doing here drinking with this person? You understand what I'm saying? Because to them, there are certain things in their mind, if you are a God-fearing person, you shouldn't do. Maybe it's good for you, but to bind it on someone else, there's a problem with that. And listen to what Jesus said to them. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. You need to be out there with the sick people, telling them about Jesus. You need to be out there with those sinners, telling them about Jesus. They're the one who need Jesus. We need them too, but people out there need them. And if you don't go where they are, how can you tell them about Jesus? Yes, yeah, sometimes we're going to have visitors come in here, and that's great, and we appreciate you. But most of the time, worldly people don't come to church. They are out there. So we need to go out there with them and talk to them about God. They emphasize on all these things. They emphasize on these teachings because to them, that's what makes you pious. Like fasting and praying. One day, some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly. We fast and pray regularly. But you, you just, just keep on eating all the time and drinking with people who are not even in the church. You need to fast and you need to pray. They emphasize that a lot. Even in Luke chapter 18, when Jesus was telling a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector who went to the temple to pray, one of the things he mentioned is that I fast twice a week because fasting was so important to them. They believe these are the things that show how pious you are, how religious you are. Oh, one thing they overemphasize on, I think enough. And there are some preachers and pastors out there who emphasize on that a lot as well. It was so bad that they found themselves, Jesus said, you emphasize, you overemphasize on tithing and offering so bad, you are telling people, hey, if your parents are sick, don't help them. Use the money and give it to the church. What? That's literally what they said. The Bible says, Jesus said, you know the law says, honor your father and your mother, which means help them, respect them. But you are saying, hey, you already made a promise to the church to give 10%. So you can't take your money and help your father and your mother. No, you need to give it to the church. Imagine me telling you, you can't pay your bills. You need to bring the money here. I know that won't fly in water, Barry. <laughs> That's what they were doing. They were over emphasizing on, on teaching such as tithing and offering. Should we give? Yes, we should give. But we shouldn't overemphasize on that like the Pharisees were doing. And Jesus said, what sorrows await you teachers of religious laws? You are hypocrites, for you are careful to teach about tithing and offerings, which is fine. But you are neglecting justice, mercy, and faith. You are teaching all the time about circumcision, washing hands. Okay, but what about justice? Do you teach about that? What about mercy? Is that important to you? What about faith? You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more, the more important things, Jesus said. Beloved, you want to be grateful to God? You need to be a people of justice. You need to be people of mercy. And you need to be a people of faith. Jesus did not say, don't give to the church. We should give. But Jesus said, just as much as you emphasize on some teachings, make sure you emphasize on justice, mercy, 
and faith. Just give me five minutes. I just want to talk about justice today. And we'll talk about mercy next Sunday. What does it mean to do justice in the eyes of God? I don't want you to think about the justice system here in America. I want you to think about what God says about it. According to the Bible, it means to do what is right by people. Do what is just by people. Treat people right and treat people fair. That's what the Bible says about it. Because that's who God is. We need to learn how to treat people the right way. And be fair in the way that we treat people. And check this out. We shouldn't be doing the right thing by people and being just when it's only convenient to us. Sometimes doing the right thing can be inconvenient. Doing the right thing can be unpleasant. But yet God wants us to stand for justice. God wants us to stand for fairness. In Proverbs chapter 31, I can't remember the right verse, right before you start reading about the, the virtuous woman, the Bible says we need to speak up for the voiceless. Make sure you talk about justice for those who do not have justice. God's people must be about that. One of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King, he said, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it political? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? When you are a child of God, you shouldn't be thinking, is it safe? Is it political? Is it the right way? Is the culture okay with it? Is it popular? No, you need to ask yourself, is it right? Is the Bible okay with it? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor good for politics, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. And that is what God expects of his people. You want to be a people who are grateful towards God? Do things because it is right. Because there's justice in there. In Proverbs chapter number 22, verse number 3, the Bible says the Lord is more pleased, not that he's not pleased at all, but the Lord is more pleased when his people do what is right and just than when we worship. We can worship, he loves it. We can praise, he loves it. But the Bible says he's more pleased when we do what is right, when we promote justice. Because God wants us to be the kind of people who treat everyone with fairness and justice. It's to do what is right. In the book of Micah, the problem that was going on, read Micah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 3. Micah was accusing the leaders of Israel of bribery. He was accusing them of bending justice to favor the wealthy. That's what he was doing. The law forbid in Deuteronomy that the land of a family should be taken from them and be sold to the highest bidder. It was against the law, but people in the land at that time, they were taking away from the poor and giving to the wealthy. And then you go to temple and you worship God and you expect God to come to your rescue? Micah said, no, that's not the God we serve. You cannot worship God, expect God to bless you while you are mistreating your neighbor, the people around you. That's not justice. That's not fairness. Micah had some to say because he was speaking against an unjust system that favored one group of people over another. Read Micah chapter 3 and chapter 3 and chapter 4. You'll see it in there. Micah said, you cannot expect God to bless you while you have a system in place to bring down those people. Micah said it doesn't work that way. In Isaiah chapter 58, God had the same problem. Listen to what they said. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn about God. They act like they are a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of God. They act like it. They ask me to take action on their behalf. They are asking God to take action on, their on behalf of their nation, pretending they want to be God. 
Listen to the rest of the sins of the verse. What good is worship, fasting, when you keep on fighting and quarreling among you? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with God. You can fast all you want. You can pray all you want. You can worship all you want. But you are mistreating people. You are abusing people. You humble yourselves by going through the motion of penance. You bow your heads and you pray. You put on burlaps. You fast. You don't eat so that you can fast. And you do all of that. Listen to what God says. No. This is not the kind of worship I want. You need to free those who are wrongly imprisoned. That's how you say thank you. You need to lighten the burden of those who work for you and let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Justice. We cannot claim to be children of God and practice injustice because God is a God of justice. And more importantly, God gives no preferential treatment to anyone. He treats everyone the same, everyone equally. And God expects that of us. In James chapter 2, verse number 1 through 4, the Bible says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Jim says, that's not faith. You're favoring a group of people. You're treating these people better, maybe because, I don't know, they have money. Let's look at James chapter 2. That's what James said. In James chapter 2, he said, for example, this is just an example. Suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and then others come in who is poor, dressed in dirty clothes, and you gave special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, uh, you, can, you can sit right there on the floor. Well, doesn't this discriminate? Discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Jim said, you cannot call yourself a child of God and treat people unfairly and treat people unjustly. That is not how we show gratitude. But more importantly, the reason why we need to practice justice, it's because God is a God of justice. God is a God of justice. In Psalm chapter 9, verse number 8, the Bible says God will judge the world with justice. Oh, no one can escape the justice system of God. We can escape the justice in the world if you want to, but not God. Listen to what Paul says in Acts 17, and I'm closing. Paul says, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice. A day will come when God will judge the world with justice. How? Through Jesus Christ. And we know so because he rose Jesus from the dead. Beloved, everyone will have to face the justice system of God one day, especially the wicked one especially those who are practicing injustice today. And no matter how good of a person you think you've been, I can promise you that the jury in God's courtroom will have one verdict for you. You know what it is? Guilty of all charges. Every single one of you. Doesn't matter how good you think you are. Doesn't matter how bad you think they are. Every single one of us will have one verdict guilty on all account because according to god's righteous justice system we all deserve to die that's the penalty well Dunny, my, my sin wasn't that bad it doesn't matter guilty you are guilty and god's justice demands you pay a price for your crime and no one no matter your status, no matter your privileges, no matter your financial situation, no one can escape God's justice system. But God, that's where you guys start smiling. But God, because he's so loving, because he's so gracious, he sent Jesus to pay the price on your behalf. That's why Paul said righteousness 
has been imputed on our account. Do you understand that? 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 21, I believe. Just think of it. I'm, I'm almost just think of it in the term like those of you who are parents, you have kids in college. You know, all kids in co college are broke, right? And then they ain't got no money in their account. They give you a call, hey, Jim, you know, I'm broke. And can you put some money in my account? You know, Mary does that sometimes. And you send some money in their account, right? They didn't work for that money. Frankly, they don't deserve that money. The only way you put that money in their account, it's because that's your child. And you love him. And that's what Jesus does for us. All of us, according to his justice system, we are all guilty. But Jesus came. He said, God, I'm going to pay it for them. I'm going to put some money on their account. I'm going to add some righteousness on their account. That's what Jesus does for us. Beloved, you will face God's justice. And the only thing that's going to get you out of that predicament, it's if you have Jesus in your life. That's it. That's the only way. You can hear Jesus say, no condemn." nation for those who are in christ jesus romans chapter 8 verse number one beloved let's be people who love justice and let's understand that we are all guilty and it's only through the water grave of baptism that we can add on jesus christ and one day when we stand in heaven the judge who is god himself you are guilty but jesus paid it all for you if you want to accept jesus come on forward Let's all stand and sing together.